And welcome to this Road Centre um, second to last talk that we'll be doing this year. And it's a particular pleasure, and I actually really mean that this time, to uh, welcome James Ashley Morrison to campus. Uh, mainly because I've been a consumer of his work uh, since the beginning. He did a couple of pieces in international organisation. Uh, they're not just brilliant. I, the one, I can give the highest accolade possible, which is how the fuck did that get NIO? <laughs> right? I mean, it's just like, really? Wow, you got that past the censors? That's amazing. Um, sh shouldn't be swearing. Sorry, we're on YouTube. Um, hi to everyone on <laughs> Hi to everyone on YouTube. I didn't, that was a mispronunciation, it's the accent. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, we're here, and uh, for everyone who's watching on YouTube Live, because I tweeted it out endlessly, uh, welcome. Um, so we're going to have James talk uh, for about 30 minutes, uh, 35 minutes about his book, this amazing book. I'll tell you how amazing it is, right? Here's one of the endorsements on the back. A brilliant account of how Britain's attempt to restore the gold standard after World War I was ideologically driven. Brexit, the contemporary parallel, likely, likewise aims to restore what actually never was. To understand why policy can be so detached from material interests, read this book. Mark Blythe. So there you go, there's a bit of home team advantage on there. A uh, little bit about James, he is uh, recently promoted to Associate Professor in the Department of International Relations at the London School of Economics. Uh, prior to the LSE, he was at Middlebury College for a bit and the Niehaus Centre at Princeton. Uh, he originally started off as a historian, hence the deep historical reach and depth of his work, but then transferred against all sense into political science at Stanford and yet managed to survive and prosper. So uh, he's a remarkable scholar, I deeply admire his work, and uh, with that I will let him start talking and I'll sit down and enjoy the show, as should the rest of you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mark, for having me, and thank you for the very kind introduction and all of the support and, and frankly, encouragement and guidance you've given to me. Uh, over the years. It's been just an uh, absolute delight to, to learn with and, and from you. And uh, I have some friends here as well, and so I'm grateful that uh, they've, they've, they've turned up and uh, helped me along the way as well. And wonderful to meet new, new people, make new friends. I just want to set a timer so that I can keep track of my time. Uh, so this talk is going to be mostly about this book, England's Cross of Gold. I don't think I'll have time to talk a little bit about what's uh, cooking these days, but perhaps in the Q&A we can come to that. I begin with these striking Time magazine covers of these pivotal individuals, Winston Churchill, Maynard Keynes, and in the middle is the longest serving, perhaps most powerful governor, bank, uh, governor of the Bank of England, Montague Norman. So this book just out, at, uh, available at fine bookstops, all the rest. I'm going to tell you right away what this project and my broader research agenda is all about, and that's to try to show how pivotal actors' beliefs, these specific individuals in this case, led to what we call the great transformation of the global monetary order. So that's the upshot. So... You're probably thinking, old time, is time Magazine covers, this guy's a historian, there's going to be a lot of great material to discuss. Cool, story time, yay. But don't worry, if you're a social scientific type or you're interested in history but not this history, that's okay, because you'll see I'm trying to make two social scientific contributions as well, more generalizable. First, to show in this pivotal case the role of ideas substantially outweighed material factors as we usually define them, and second, individuals were more important than the institutions in which they were embedded. So I'll begin by talking about the big empirical puzzle, Churchill's restoration. So on April 28, 1925, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Winston Churchill, announced his plan to Parliament to make Great Britain great again. And the idea was to restore the gold standard. Now, many of you perhaps know the UK was famous as the conductor of the international orchestra of the global financial system. It was the linchpin of that international monetary order. During the war, however, they suspended convertibility. They gave themselves a few years to get back onto the gold standard. And here, in April of 25, um, Churchill announces to Parliament that we're going to go back a full eight months before Parliament required it and expected it. And it was an unmitigated disaster for Churchill, for the UK, for the British Empire, and for the world. But you don't have to take my word for it. Here is Robert Mundell, Nobel Prize winning economist, in his Nobel Prize address from 1999. I argue 
that many of the political changes in the century have been caused by little understood perturbations in the international monetary system. Had the price of gold been raised in the late 20s, or alternatively, had the major central banks pursued policies of price stability instead of adhering to the gold standard, there would have been no Great Depression, no Nazi Revolution, and no World War II. Nobel Prize winner, it's all about this decision to go back onto gold. So, no surprise, there's lots of explanations. This is one of the most important decisions in modern history. Let me give you just a bit of the highlights of the way that we have been trying to understand this over the last century. One thing that's kind of striking is that it almost seems overdetermined. There are so many reasons why Churchill might have done this. It aligned with conservative party ideology, conservative party politics. Churchill loved the symbols of the old ancient order, all these kinds of things. But let's start at the top. Let's start at the international system level and the hegemonic stability theorists specifically see this as the kind of last gasp of the waning hegemon. Here's Charles Kindleberger, one of the famous HST theorists, and he says, look, it's not about individuals like Churchill, the central bankers, Montague Norman, none of these people. The puerile central bank quarrels were mostly the product of imagination, and they mattered only in small part with the deep structural forces at play. Okay, no surprise, system level theorists, big structural theories, not a lot of room for agency. But even when we open up the black box of the state and we look within the state, most of what we've been doing in the field of international political economy has looked like structural materialism. Most famous perhaps is Jeff Frieden's account. Could not be clear. Hard money supporters of the gold standard regarded the government commitment to gold as tantamount to a government promise to secure the value of their property. Gold protected investors. Keynes's arguments had little power in the battle with such entrenched interests. Now, Frieden's actually drawing on a, a much deeper, broader tradition within the social sciences of this kind of structural materialism. Perhaps even more famous is the account from Beth Simmons in her Woodrow Wilson award-winning book, Best Book in Political Science, Who Adjusts, from 1994. And she says, ah, you've got to look at the institution, central bank independence. You've got to look at party ID. Ultimately, we find people on the left didn't care as much about defending the gold standard as trying to mitigate unemployment, and people on the right ultimately cared more about the strong currency, defending the gold standard, and let the workers suffer. But notice that when Simmons says, who adjusts, she's not actually really talking about specific individuals, specific human beings. We have three governors of the Bank of England from 1914 to 1944, one of them is mentioned on one page, Montague Norman. We have eight chancellors of the Exchequer. Five are not mentioned at all. Chamberlain, Snowden, Churchill mentioned only briefly. Five five ministers, three not mentioned, and a few pages on Chamberlain and MacDonald. Even Keynes himself is in three footnotes. There's one in-text citation and one quote from Kindleberger, where Kindleberger quotes Keynes and Simmons quotes Kindleberger. Now, to be fair, this is a book about a large number of countries, but remember, the UK is the single most important part of the gold standard. And to understand what happens in the UK, apparently we don't need to tell stories about individuals. So Kindleberger, Frieden, Simmons, and so many others think that material factors ultimately matter more than ideas, and that the institutions and the institutional design matters more than the individuals who are operating within them. But of course, here I am at Brown University. We all know better, don't we? We have wonderful ideational accounts that talk about the role that ideas play, obviously. But even within IPE, on this specific case, not in IPE in general, but on this specific case, most of the ideational stories we've told still privilege structure over agency. Here's Peter Hall's wonderful book, The Political Power of Economic Ideas, Keynesianism Across Nations. And here's what he says. Prosaic as it might seem, the orientation of the governing party appears to have been the single most important factor affecting the likelihood a nation would pursue Keynesian policies. Keynesian policies were much more commonly initiated by parties with strong ties to the working class than by their conservative or bourgeois rivals. Political power of economic ideas, not different than Simmons. In the finding, labor didn't want to have the gold standard, and the Tories did. Keynes is right on the cover, and yet Keynes doesn't really matter. Even the historians, even the historians, like Philip Williamson, national crisis, national government, goes out of his way to explain to us how little Maynard Keynes mattered. It's a distortion 
in the study of economic policy is the disproportionate influence attributed to people like Maynard Keynes. Remarkable is the attention given to Keynes. It's on a scale explicable only in terms of his subsequent influence. Now, of course, he had valuable ideas, but within the whole context of assessing the practicality of policies, Keynes was of no more importance than backbench MPs or the editors of a couple newspapers. Historian, out of his way, Keynes did not matter. Here's David Kennedy, Pulitzer Prize winning historical account of the interwar period, and he says Keynes did not matter. The operational heart of Keynesian economics was not a conceptually difficult formula to grasp. Many American policymakers had intuited the essence of these ideas before Keynes put them to paper. Many economists in the last analysis simply wrapped the mantle of academic theory around the practical dictates of instinct and necessity. Surely what the world eventually came to know as Keynesianism grew as much from the jumble of circumstances, politics, and adaptation as it did from the pages of textbooks. Policymakers fumbled their way to Keynesianism long before Keynes bothered to write the ideas down. In other words, it's not that policymakers listened to Keynes because he was celebrated. Keynes is celebrated because he advocated the policies that the rising left had already sought for other reasons. Well, this will shock you. I wrote a book, and I disagree with that. And that's the point of writing the book. Let me tell you my story, England's Cross of Gold. It has three basic components, orthodoxy, mythology, and theocracy. Let's start with the orthodoxy. Well, I disagree with this partly because, like Mark Blythe, I'm really inspired a lot by Karl Polanyi's account of what happened in this period, the Great Transformation. Now, Polanyi himself says belief in the gold standard was the faith of the age. The essentiality of the gold standard was the one and only tenet common to men of all nations and all classes, religious denominations, and social philosophies. Everybody, Polanyi says, agreed the gold standard was essential. Now, of course, again, it's easy to understand why Churchill restored the gold standard, so it seems. But let's look at the hard cases, right? The gold mine owners, who should have wanted the price of gold to rise, quite naturally. And then the workers, who all our models predict, should have wanted to avoid deflation, particularly those in the export sector. So let's look at those hard cases. This is Lord Harris, who is the chairman after... Um, Cecil Rhodes of the Consolidated Goldfields Group of South Africa, the consortium of all the gold mine owners, the white men in London who own the gold mines in South Africa, are pulling out tens of millions of pounds sterling of gold and pumping it into London from South Africa. He comes to one of these all-important secret currency committee meetings to talk about what the gold interests of the British Empire wants. You would think if you're going to have a gold standard, you probably want to know about the people who produce the gold for your gold standard. So they bring him in. It's a confidential meeting. It's very clear in the minutes. Hey, this is confidential. Yes, it's OK. We're minting it, but it's OK. It's secret. And this is what he says to the heavy hitters on the currency committee about what the gold miners of the British Empire want for the gold standard. I will not attempt to deal with the intricate subject of the relations of gold to currency and to commerce. I do not profess to give any opinion about the exchanges, or about currency, or about credit, or about any of those more abstruse difficulties. He doesn't have any idea. He has no idea how the gold standard works, and he admits it. So what does he have to do? Defer to the experts on the committee. He accepts explicitly the deflation, the lowering of the price of gold, which is the thing that he and his fellow interested buddies are selling. All they can muster is the imagination to ask the government for a subsidy. If you give us some gold, we'll open more mines and give you more gold. What a brilliant mind. Now, obviously, these particular capitalists are very confused. They're uncurious. I was really, truly shocked when I saw this. I couldn't believe it. But notice that the labor side also believed in the essentiality of the gold standard. Now, contrary to the way that we often talk about them, they had a really sophisticated analysis. Years. They spent years, the unions, the trade union congress, studying the problem, compiling new price indices, working out new economic models to understand how the gold standard worked and why it was that their real wage had fallen so precipitously. So they had a very extensive and very sophisticated analysis. Oddly, for some reason I don't quite understand, nobody else seems to have talked about this. Even though they published these things, there are all these minutes from the unions, and so I spent quite some time working through this, learning with them about how the gold standard actually worked. This is one instance, their interim report on money and prices published in 1920. This is from the Joint Committee on the Cost of Living, which was convened by the Parliamentary Committee of the Trade Union Congress, which is the union of all the unions. Now, Jeff Friedman's not here, 
but if he were here, I'd make sure to flag this up for him. Notice that one of the people on that committee is Robert Smiley, sometime president of the Miners' Federation of Great Britain. That group that was hit the very hardest by the restoration of the gold standard in 1925, the ones who demanded, called for, and got the general strike in 1926. He's on the committee, and he approves this, and this is their official message to the UK government. They resolved the UK should return to the pre-war parity between currency and gold. They fully expected a reduction of the general price level by about 20%, 20% deflation. They did this despite that they recognized that it would cause quote, a drastic restriction of the currency would result in widespread unemployment. Why? <laughs> what gives? Why did the workers demand deflation? Precisely the opposite of what all of the IPE materialist stories tell us. And the answer is actually simple. Because nobody imagined that it was possible, except for Maynard Keynes. Nobody questioned the return to gold because nobody believed it was possible to leave gold without having something even worse happen, which was hyperinflation. This was a cornerstone of the Victorian gold standard orthodoxy. You try to leave, have your cake, eat it too, the monetary system collapses. And think about the early 1920s, the experience of people in Central and Eastern Europe where they did leave the gold standard, where they did suffer hyperinflation. Everybody in the UK reads this experience, they see this in the newspapers, they talk about this, and they think this is going to happen to the pound sterling. Here are women using their currency, not as currency to buy firewood, but literally burning their money to generate heat because it's cheaper than using it as money to buy firewood. And labor rights, conservatives, they're all there saying, do you want the pound to end up like this? Leave the gold standard, you'll see. We've always known this, and we have fresh empirical proof that this is the way the world works. So much so that labor was not one of the strongest advocates of going back onto the gold standard, and the shadow chancellor, Philip Snowden, actually attacked Churchill in February of 1925 for not going back fast enough. And this wasn't secret. He published this in an editorial, attacking the conservatives for being dilatory. He writes, this question of the return to gold is a very practical matter from the point of view of the welfare of the working classes. It may for a time present some difficulties, but they are small compared with the evils from which the world is suffering as a result of fluctuating currencies. World opinion in favor of returning to the gold basis is too overwhelming for any other course to be accepted. To restore stability, we must bind the currency to gold. Editorial, Labor's sometime chancellor. He would be chancellor again when Labor wins again in 29. And he is saying, Churchill is betraying us. We need the gold standard. Let's get back ASAP. So this story, party ID, it doesn't work. It just does not work. You go through, you read the documents. It doesn't, I don't see it. Polanyi's story, everybody agreed. Go back on the gold standard. I completely agree. Polanyi was right. So that's why I say these ideas, these beliefs, matter so much more than how we have post hoc constructed their material interests. So that's the orthodoxy, widespread, deeply held, top priority for everybody. Let's go on to mythology. So everybody believed in the gold standard, but crucially, the gold standard, to quote somebody in the room, did not come with an instruction sheet. What is the gold standard? How do you put it together? I don't know. It makes IKEA look easy. The trouble is everybody believed in the gold standard, but no two people agreed on the all-important specifics of what the commandment, restore the gold standard, actually meant, in either theoretical or practical terms. Now, the book is a long book, 400 pages or so. I have lots of examples. I'll just give you a couple of the highlights. First, the gold standard in theory. Let's look at our three governors of the Bank of England, Cunliffe, Cocaine, and Norman. Each one defines the gold standard in an incommensurable way. Cunliffe was actually quite progressive, and he argued vigorously that we should try to use government debt as a substitute gold reserve. Quite progressive, and now we sort of take that innovation for granted. His successor, his immediate successor, Brian Cocaine, lunges in the opposite direction. He says, no, widespread circulation of gold is a prerequisite. We won't be on gold until I have gold coins back in my pocket. He actually encouraged people to cash in their notes to precipitate a financial crisis to force through structural adjustment. The governor of the Bank of England. Well, then comes Governor Norman. He has an orthogonal perspective on the gold standard. He wants capital controls. He multiple times tried to delay the return to the gold standard. And he wanted to make gold so difficult that you had to purchase a minimum of 100,000 ounces of gold from the Bank of England. This is equivalent to 120 million pounds. So we went from a situation where you had gold coins in your pocket to the new gold standard, 
where the only people who could actually get gold were purchasing it, in Norman's mind, at 121 million pounds at a crack in today's money. That's just in theory. Totally different versions of the gold standard. All reasonable versions of the gold standard, but incompatible. Now, in practice, it's just as varied. Obviously, the gold standard varied across space. Different countries had different ideas. It varied, actually, even within the British Isles. But interestingly, even in London, the center of the gold standard, there was massive cross-temporal variation. So before the war, about half the UK's pounds by value were specie, minted precious metal coins, the sovereign and the half-sovereign made of gold. After the restoration in 25, the servants are no, no longer circulated. They're all moved into reserve. Private banks are forced to pay their gold into the Bank of England and accept government paper instead. And the Scottish gold is seized by the Bank of England. Ireland escaped that only by having gotten independence. Massive difference in your gold standard. Convertibility, I mentioned Norman wanted to raise it absurdly high. Well, before the war, the minimum purchase was half a pound, 10 shillings for half sovereign. After, Norman doesn't get his 100,000 ounces, but he and Churchill agree to make it 1,700 pounds for a minimum purchase. This is 3,000 times higher, more difficult to actually get your hands on gold. And last, the gold to note ratio. Before the war, was calculated about 85% gold cover for each paper note in circulation. After the restoration, it's 33%. Now, notice the gold price in London is actually constant across both periods. So they had an excess of gold before relative to what they were able to do after. The point here, and I can multiply the examples, but I'm mindful of the time. The idea of a singular canonical gold standard was a myth. The gold standard, no such thing. It was vigorously advanced in this period by those who sought to define the content of this gold standard order. Now, following Michel Foucault, we might say that this was a, or I would say the, governmentality of liberal political economy. But they didn't have that vocabulary. They didn't have Foucault. They talked about it as a religion. Remember Polanyi, belief in the gold standard was the faith of the age. And so I've tried to write this history in the spirit tradition of religious history as a struggle between individuals to define, promulgate, and instantiate competing beliefs about money. Now, a quick disclaimer. I don't like the gold standard. Sometimes people think, oh, you must like the gold standard, writing a book. Well, I don't. I hate it in theory, and I really hate it in practice. As I see it, my own, these are just my own views here, we have privileged, often clueless white men in London impose an idiotic system that's really bad for them. It's especially bad for poor people and unimaginably bad for the people of color, often children, working in these dangerous conditions in the imperial gold mines. It was toxic to international relations and came with and also from Victorian toxic masculinity. Not so far from Rudyard Kipling's white man's burden type of thinking. My whole purpose here is to deconstruct this order and the mythology that still surrounds it, and that's oddly becoming more popular with people like Ted Cruz and Donald Trump. Let's go on then to theocracy. So the official plan for restoring the gold standard was issued by the Cunliffe Committee in 1918 to find the essence of the UK's complete and effective gold standard as the reality that both paper notes and gold coins stand in absolute parity with gold bullion. And they argue that if the rules aren't violated, you follow these simple rules, the amount of legal tender will be determined automatically. Mechanical, automatic, markets work, everything is wonderful, everything stays in parity. Well, that was 1918. By 1923, Keynes had published his revolutionary tract on monetary reform, and it completely eviscerated this complete mess up thinking. Now, I love this book, Long Red and We're All Dead, so on, so many Wonderful insights from that book. It's one of my favorites. But I'll just highlight three things that mattered politically, that really actually shaped the way the world hung together in the 1920s and after. First, exchange movements are not driven exclusively by material conditions, but depend crucially on market psychology. Second, the international gold standard is not automatic, but it turns on the agency active management of central bankers. Third, the US Federal Reserve now dictates the de facto world gold supply. So the key metric must be changed from the London gold price to the dollar value of the pound. Now from this, Keynes built what he called his ideal system, intimate cooperation between the Fed and the Bank of England to secure stability of prices and of exchange at the same time. These are the roots of the Bretton Woods system in 1923. Now I've done a lot of work to show that these ideas actually did shape 
policy and policymakers. I've gone through all these testimonies, memoranda, surviving bits of paper. As I mentioned to Mark and Jeff at the beginning, you know, I spared no time or effort on this book of mine. And the book shows, contrary to all these previous accounts, that Montague Norman actually embraced and built upon the very approach and proposals adopted by Keynes. I could give you many examples, but let me highlight a few things. Norman versus the Cunliffe Committee. Reserve policy. Cunliffe Committee, you must amass at least 150, probably more like 200 million pounds sterling of reserves. What does Norman do? He takes the gold the UK has and sends it abroad. Exactly the opposite. No come with committee? Mercantilists. How are we going to get all this gold? Well, mercantilism. We're going to have a positive balance of trade, and that will bring in gold inflows. What does Norman do? He takes that gold from the UK and uses it to help the Germans rebuild their export-oriented industries. Exactly the opposite of what was prescribed. And the whole management of the system, the whole approach, was fundamentally different. Come with committee. Again, it's structural, it's material, it's automatic. We're going to react to markets with material changes, forcing through structural adjustments. Norman, no, we're not going to do any of that. I'm going to get on the steps of the Bank of England. I'm going to steer market psychology by making grand pronouncements about central bank cooperation. We won't have to force through the adjustments. So this is why I find the individuals matter more than the institutions. Zero formal changes in the Bank of England. What changed? The people running the bank. Conliffe wanted to do it one way. Cocaine did it another way. Norman did it his way. Norman gets hit by bus in 1920. Conliffe doesn't you have a totally different gold standard. Simple as that. Now, in the book, I emphasize that in social science in general, we've done too much. I think the pendulum has gone too far in the direction of trying to personify institutions. This is what Whitehall wants. This is what the White House wants. This is what the bank wants. And obviously, that happens, and we need some of that. But I'm trying to push the pendulum back in the other direction. We try to understand the causes of things, the motto of my school, the LSE. Too often we ask what, when we really ought to ask who. Who was in control? Who did these things? Not what. So Beth Simmons, who adjusts, it's really more what happened and where did it happen. And for me, it's really who did what and when did they do it. It's a different approach. Now, contrary to Keynes' subsequent denunciations, it wasn't just Norman, the governor of the Bank of England. It was also the chancellor of the Exchequer, Winston Churchill actually embraced many of Keynes's ideas. So he becomes chancellor in the autumn of 1924. Then he spends the first few months badgering the mandarins at the treasury and his colleagues at the bank to explain why Keynes is wrong and why the orthodoxy is right. And at first, he expects this is going to be a simple, short, for, straightforward thing. Everybody believes this except for Keynes, so just show me the problems in Keynes's argument. But what he finds is they can't do it. Keynes is not obviously wrong. Keynes has a very trenchant critique of the way the gold standard has been working and continues to operate. And so he gets more and more angry. You're not responding. Here's, Keynes says this, show me the, you know, rebut it, refute it, show me. Well, but nobody takes him seriously. I don't care if anybody takes him seriously. I want to know why Keynes is wrong. I take him seriously. Do your job. And eventually they come around and they make these arguments. Now, ultimately, Churchill is deeply ambivalent, as he later admits. He doesn't see that Keynes is wrong, but he also doesn't see that the Treasury is wrong. And the specter of hyperinflation is very worrying to him and everybody else. Better to commit a sin of omission than a sin of commission, is what he ultimately does. So he tests Keynes in person, realizes he's going to have to make a judgment call, and crucially, he secures the blessing from industry. Another thing that historians and other scholars seem to misunderstand is Churchill was in close contact with the Federation of British Industries and then actually crafted the policy with them in mind, explaining to them how it was meant to work. Then, as you've seen, in April 25, they go back on gold, but it's a to total Churchillian speech. Wonderful address to Parliament, filled with contradictions, evasions, obfuscations, and frankly, downright lies about what's happening. He misleads them to make them think you're going back to the 1914 gold standard when he knows full well that he and Norman have concocted a new gold standard. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Hang on. You said Churchill went back and it was a disaster. Now you're saying Churchill didn't really go back. He went to a new gold standard. Yes, that's right. What gives? Well, it's a radical departure from the old gold standard, but it's still a gold standard. It didn't go far enough. So I think um, I've been talking for 27 minutes. Should I keep going or should I? Keep going. Okay, so what's next? What have I been working on 
these days. Institutions. It's back to this, about how individuals try to institutionalize their personalities rather than institutions shaping the individuals. I want to look at that other process that I think we often overlook. Now, I came from IPE where everything starts with materialism, at least as far as I was taught. And so my first objective is always ideas over material variables. But I also came to see it's also about structure versus agency. And that was a kind of secondary question in the book. Now I'm kind of reversing those. And I want to do more work on structure versus agency as such, specifically this thing, institutions. And I say institutions, and you say Doug North. And you're not wrong. This is from the famous North and Weingast article about the 1690s, the Gorse Revolution. North says, the more likely it is that the sovereign will alter property rights for his or her own benefit, the lower the expected returns from investment, and the lower, in turn, the incentive to invest. It's all about trying to maximize individuals' interests by creating an institution that allows us to protect our property rights, and we end up doing, by tying our own hands like Odysseus, we get the benefits of hearing the sirens without being cast upon the shoals. Now here I oddly, I was a little bit disconcerted, find myself agreeing with Jeff Frieden quite, quite vigorously. Frieden says, property rights, Doug North, Barry Weingast, you want to talk about property rights, what's the most important property right? Property rights in money. If you can control people's property and money, you can control most of their other property rights too. So that's the key. Not just property rights, property rights and money. Now what institution is more important than that which determines who controls the value of money? So that's what I'm looking at now. Several different little projects exploring the origins of this fixed exchange rate system in the first place, one hand, and on the other hand, central bank independence on the other. Now, supposedly, the claimed origins of central bank independence go back to the 1690s, Locke versus Lowndes, the public intellectual versus the secretary of the treasury. It's all about the glorious revolution. And I think that's not entirely wrong. There's a lot there. But we also have the creation of the Bank of England, which comes in 1694. So we have all these shifts, the glorious revolution, the creation of the fixed standard, and the uh, creation of the Bank of England all happen at the same time. They all relate to property rights, and they all relate to the property rights in money. And yet, we're having these kind of dissonant conversations about these things when I think they need to be fit together a little more systematically. I think we've actually misunderstood, frankly, looked over the enormous tension between these crucial innovations. Now, so my early research was about uh, Andrew Jackson and the bank war in the 1820s, 1830s. I say bank, you say easy paper money, right? But apparently not for North and Weingast. Apparently, Bank of England printing paper currency is strong money, but at the same time, Locke's saying, let's restore the metallic standard. Where's that in the story? So I, I think that there's a lot more tension there than we've realized. As I say, these are, these are early days. I'm still getting the archival material from, uh, I was at the British Library and Oxford and so on, digging this up. Other little thing here is, where do we actually get central bank independence? I think it's back to this period in the 20s. Walter Cunliffe defers to the Treasury, during the First World War, and Norman hates him for it. So I'll tell you very briefly about that. Cunliffe, who's governor throughout the First World War, says Bank of England has an unavoidable public role. It ought to cooperate fully with the Treasury in helping the Treasury get the capital it needs to fight the First World War. So we should work together to maintain the gold standard. We're trying to spend a lot of money on the war. Our production is down, but we still don't have the gold standard, so we've got to work together, the Treasury and the bank. No central bank independence at all. Norman submarines him within the bank, ousts him, essentially. Because for him, the Bank of England is a private institution. It is literally a private institution until it's nationalized in 1946. The whole purpose of the bank, to quote Milton and Rose Friedman, is to maximize shareholder return. This is a private institution, central bank, who cares? Our shareholders need profits. We're making a lot of money, loaning money to the government, helping the government borrow money from the public. We get a percentage of that. I know there's a war on, but look, we're going to have bumper profits. Let's share that with the shareholders. And Cunliffe says, well, let's give some of it back to the people whose kids are getting conscripted. So there's a massive row within the bank. Norman says, look, the gold standard requires that we maintain vital independence. Otherwise, we're going to roll over for the treasury all the time. And don't worry, this is a little bit like the George Mason school um, uh, of thinking. You have banks, competition between banks. That incentivizes good behavior. I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that, but that's what Norman, that's the tradition from which Norman is coming. Keynes, I'll end with Keynes. It's always good to end with Keynes. Keynes, <laughs> Keynes says it's both. There's been a great change since the war, the First World War, in relations between the Bank of England and the Treasury. 
I should reform the constitution of the bank. I should develop the power of the bank's committee of treasury, which is within the bank, which sets monetary policy. One might make the representation of the treasury rather more formal than it is in present, make the bank not so private. I do not regard the Bank of England as a private institution, even though it's formally such. I regard it as one of our heaven-sent institutions by, through which anomalistic methods we get the advantages of both a private and of a public institution. Now, that's great for Keynes to say, and it's nice to think we can have the benefits of central bank independence, but also help the Treasury with, with, with uh, the Great War, or with 2008, or obviously these days, COVID. But that runs contrary to the whole purpose of central bank independence. So this is something else that I'm trying to think about as I think about institutional design. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. You can field it all the questions. Questions. Jack. Uh, James. Uh, love book. Uh, Thanks. Uh, so it's just great to see you do it. Um, I think the the two core arguments you make, right? The ideas over material factors. I'm going to give you a big uh, green check mark. I'm. I'm. I'm all right. I'm all. Uh, uh, yeah. The second one. I should be in. Right, the, yep. the, the individuals um, really matter uh, part of the story. Yep. I, I've written on this, I agree, I think I want to, to matter, but then I, on the, I, I find myself unclear what the beef you have is with people like Friedman and Kittleberger with regards to this. Because it seems like you could have swapped in anybody from the English elite into, into Churchill's seat, right? make them the chancellor and anybody at all except for John Maynard Keynes, and you would get basically the same decision. And so if that's true, if you could swap in any other individual, then how can we say that individuals really matter? Um, is it, it, it seems like, okay, so ideas matter. This whole class of people were wrong, right? And they made silly decisions. But on, on this case, I'm just not seeing why Frieden is wrong when he says, look, Keynes is arguing against this like whole group of people, and he can't make any headway because he's just completely outnumbered, that seems like consistent with what you're saying. So walk me through that. Great, great, great question, Jeff. Um, so in the book, I argue that I use this metaphor of, of religion, um, partly because these figures themselves use the metaphor of religion because they didn't understand this as a science. And Keynes especially thought this is not scientific. It is a religion. And what I find is that there are as many different ways to believe in the gold standard as there are Jewish people who believe in Judaism, or Christians who believe in Christianity, and Muslims who believe in Islam, and so on and so forth. And the trouble there is that each person is totally confident that their version of Judaism is the correct version of Judaism, even though it's incompatible with every other person's version of Judaism. And so we have a kind of two-step process. Keynes is not a believer in any of those religions. So let's say for the sake of argument, all these people are Christians, Norman, Cocaine, Conliffe, or the eight chancellors of the Czech are all different versions of Christian. Well, one version comes in with a very different version of Christianity. It's still Christianity. They still insist it's Christianity. Everything is for the Christian faith, but they have radically, some of them are burning witches. Some of them are not burning witches. And that matters. That's a big difference. This version of the gold standard is different from this version of the gold standard. Now, Keynes comes along and says, we should not be Christians anymore. And all these people close ranks and say, you're nuts. Why would you do that? And so there are these two steps. Should we be Christians? Should we have a gold standard? And then if so, which one? Keynes saying, I don't agree with your premise that we need it. They say, but then we'll go to hell called hyperinflation. Hyperinflation, hell. And Keynes says, no, you won't. They say, no, you're wrong. But meanwhile, we're still going to argue about how to be the best Christians. Does that make sense? Yes, except that when you say Churchill took one version of, of gold standard, but he didn't go far enough, right. uh, then it seems like it doesn't matter what the varieties of gold standard are, it's, they're all the same. right? Well, they all produce the terrible effect in the same way that austerity produces the terrible austerity effects, but there are different austerities, and some are worse than others. I would call this run, but it's dead. <laughs> So it's oh no it's not it just it's got it's got the red light but it's the worst so that our friends on YouTube can be part of the conversation over to Tony. Yeah, I'm, I may have gotten the, the the first of all a fantastic talk 
thank you. It, it really thought provoking. I will read the book. Um, but I'm a, li a little confused, maybe along the same line of Jeff, about the empirics of the argument in the, the sense that it sounds like Churchill's conversion was acceptable because it was still being articulated within a faith whose central principle nobody could agree on. Is that correct? Yes. If that's correct, then in some ways Keynes hasn't really won in the first iteration. Is that, is that also correct? Correct. He doesn't win until the 1930s. He, he doesn't win out, out, outright in the 1930s. Okay. And it's sort of it sounds it's almost like the decomposition of a Kuhnian pro, uh, paradigm, where where, all right. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but yeah, the, yeah maybe the, I have a different version. Of it, but yeah, go on, go on. yeah, I mean you're using the the, the religious metaphor, yes, and and so maybe it's not Kuhn, it's uh, what's the guy at Berkeley? Anyway, the yeah. So this is very interesting, but but the relational problem about, you know, what would have happened. Is, is it really true that the second version of Churchill is really the acceptance of Keynes? No, it's a less bad version of the first thing still articulated within the boundaries of the faith, right? Yeah, but it, but it matters. But it matters that he took over Keynes at that point? Or was he was partially c convinced by Keynes? Is that what you're saying at that point? Yeah, so, so the way, um, to go back to these three guys, right? Who is ultra-Orthodox? It's cocaine, who says, we must have gold in our pockets. Jingling, I think is the term he uses, in our pockets. And in order to facilitate that, we should not just, you know, uh, contract the money supply. We should provoke a financial crisis, encourage people to cash in these worthless treasury notes and Bank of England notes and get their gold, and then bring the whole system down. Now, that's a really extreme view within the gold standard of how to make the gold standard operational and effective. And that's maybe like, boy, a lot of people here, they have some heresy. Let's burn them all. Let's burn them all to root out the heresy real quick, like, and it's going to hurt, and then there'll be a lot of people dead and screaming, but let's burn the witches immediately, the heretics. And then by the time we get to Norman and Churchill, it's like, well, let's not burn all the witches right now. Let's wait a little bit before we burn some witches, and maybe there'll be some witch burning to come. But, you know, let's, let's take our time a little bit, and maybe what we can do is maybe we can, maybe we can accept that there are some things that are really articles of faith that matter and some things that are maybe a little more secondary. You don't have to go with every word that Jonathan Edwards says, right, in order to avoid the angry God. Well, that's, that, that materially matters. In the same way, this materially matters. The conditions of the 1920s were awful. They could have been even worse. They would have been worse if this joker had been governor of the Bank of England. And that matters. Now, ultimately, right, Martin Luther prompts reform within the church. That matters too, right? I mean, the Reformation matters. It's materially important. We want to know about it. Now, maybe someone comes along like Keynes, who's an actual heretic, and they convince people to leave the church, well, that's even a bigger deal. So I've, one of the articles in I.O. is about 1931, when Keynes actually convinced the conservatives to leave the church, to not believe in the gold standard anymore. Who's next? Of course, our central banker. <laughs> Hi. Uh, no, thanks, thanks uh, again for... Uh, the talk it was really fascinating. It's not easy to have uh, such an entertaining talk on these topics. <laughs> That's why I use lots of pictures. <laughs> and they work well. <laughs> no, I have one, two questions actually. So one, it's one, it's easy. Like it's uh, what it was actually the power of uh, of the Bank of England at the time in terms of uh, of changing the convertibility, um, like in in the sense of what was its independence in doing it. What what, what could have been the influence of the government? or the treasury. Um, the second one was, it, it kind of connects to these uh, two previous questions. I'm wondering whether you're not comparing uh, a theory, which is Keynes theory and intellectual theory, with something that is more of a so-called folk theory. Like, um, uh, in, in the sense that 
again, like it's a it's a theory that would have been embraced by by Churchill, but also by by other members uh, of the elite. So it seems to me that, and it's something that he reflected very well also in the in the images you show. So it, it's something that can. Uh, really be attached to public opinion very easily through these people that are throwing money in the fire. And, uh, and if, if you want to do a parallel with the, it seems, it seems something that works also when you apply it to the, to the austerity debate, so where you had like a, a very complex and specific uh, theoretical framework that was put aside because the other theory, the one of like uh, um, tightening your belt, would work better not only for uh, some intellectual, but also like for, especially for politicians and uh, and the people. Right. So I. So like I'm I'm wondering whether indeed like we are comparing really two theories or one theory and a folk theory, which would be easier to also be accepted by institutions, and so this would be problematic because it matches well with the uh, with the fact that some theories uh, are sort of uh, more able to 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 get embraced by institutions than others. So I wonder whether there is something that makes these theories uh, um, more suitable to fit with institutions, and that's that's what would bring institutions back in. I, I, I see. Um, yeah. So it's okay. So what? How much power does the bank have, and um, how much autonomy do they have from the government? And then is there something about uh, approach to the gold standard A and approach to the gold standard B that might fit better with how the bank is designed or operates or the incentives of the actors who run the bank and so on. Okay, so, so I, those are what I understand to be your questions and I'm kind of close. Yeah. Okay, all right, so, so let me try to answer the, the first one. So this is one of those kinds of things, like what's a crisis, right? Mark has written a lot about it. Well, how do we define a crisis? Well, people tell us when we have a crisis. So during the war, the bank kept saying there's no crisis, everything is fine. Everything is fine. We're doing fine. We don't need to re-engineer things. Meanwhile, David Lloyd George is talking literally about nationalizing the bank. Like, oh, well, you want to talk about your shareholders. You want to keep giving them. They're paying the people a dividend for making money off of the war loans that the government is getting from the British people who are also sending their kids to die. And that, that does not sit well with Cunliffe. And he's trying to keep the treasury at arm's length. And David Lloyd George, this also doesn't fit with him, saying, why are you people getting rich off of this? Like, it seems a lot like war profiteering. And um, so day to day, yeah, the bank has total control. But there's the outside possibility that it will be outright nationalized. And Cunliffe appreciates that. Norman says they would never do that because, of course, the whole financial system would collapse and they can't afford that. So there's uncertainty within the bank about how likely it would be that they're, that they're nationalized. But within the normal setup, the quote-unquote normal day-to-day -day operation, there's zero concern about what the Treasury says. In fact, some of my other research, I have a PhD student who's doing research on this in the context of the European Central Bank uh, these days. I mean, it's, we talk about these poor, weak central bankers and the Treasury is going to come and they're going to make them do things. In the 1920s, the Bank of England is writing the budget for the government. This is what finance needs you to do. And in 1931, this is in my IO one of my IO articles about the, the departure from gold, the, the, the national government is there like, okay, fine, we'll balance the budget. Not good enough. The poor people aren't paying enough. You need to raise taxes on the poor people and reduce taxes on capital because otherwise capital gets scared. I mean, that's like independence of the treasury from the bank rather than independence of the bank from the treasury. So that's the, you know, it's an inverted starting point that I have from spending all my time reading these documents. Okay, your second question, which is, uh, is there something about this that might fit better? I don't know. I mean, before Walter Cunliffe, the governors of the Bank of England were kind of like those figures in the TV show Lost. They go and they turn the crank on a regular basis, and that's kind of the extent of their agency because the gold standard is automatic, and all you have to do is, how much gold do we have? Oh, we're running out of gold. Raise interest rates. Oh, we have too much gold. Okay, lower interest rates. It's very simple, and if they had a computer, they would have used a computer to do it, or so they said. That's how they rendered it. I don't think that's how it really worked, but that's how they stylized it. And so maybe they like that because it doesn't mean that they have to have any expertise, or they have to have any thinking, or they have to be accountable for their actions. So it's just like, oh, we use a magic formula. How much gold is in the bank vault? And uh, then they're insulated from criticism. Maybe that would fit. On the other hand, Keynes is talking here about giving central bankers all kinds of opportunity to go on nice holidays with other central bankers, maybe Davos, you know, this kind of thing, talk about how to run the world. Well, that's pretty exciting for, you know, aspiring central banker. So before Cunliffe, everybody has a two-year term. They're just wealthy people who are on the board of governors, and they take their turns and turn the cranks. Then after Cunliffe, 
Cunliffe goes in 1917 and negotiates the first Anglo-American sterling loan, a dollar loan to the UK, and signs the bank's name. So the, His Majesty's Treasury borrows money from J.P. Morgan at all, and the Bank of England puts up the collateral, this private institution. Norman didn't like that. So, I don't know. You know, how ambitious are your central bankers? Hi. Thanks, James, for a great talk. Thanks, Anne. Um, so, I have two questions. The first goes back to that slide that you were just on, that the gold standard in theory. Mm -hmm. And I think it follows on from the previous question. I guess, one of the gripes I have with the story that you're telling is you have presented this as three different interpretations of the gold standard. But you haven't really talked about how the world is dramatically changing over this time period. Um, so pre, you know, right after World War I, you have uh, basically de facto the world is going off of the gold standard. Between 1917 and 1925, you have a period in which both the US and the UK are basically, basically sterilizing gold flows. Right. So my, my question is this, is that from 1917, um, the, first the first interpretation of the gold standard is feasible in 1917. Yeah. By 1925, that interpretation is no longer feasible from the UK's point of view. Yeah. Okay, so each of these different interpretations you have of the gold standard are all coming from uh, bank governors who sit in a particular institution right. from a very particular standpoint. So can't you look at this changing interpretation of the gold standard as theory that's trying to play catch up to a reality that's changing on the ground? So if we were to kind of make an analogy, a very poor analogy to what we're going through right now, it would be the changing different interpretations of the Fed on the inflation that we're experiencing over you know, the last five years or so. So how does that kind of you know, relationship between institutional actors that are trying to play catch up with a world that is changing so quickly in face of, of kind of what the theory looked like within a, a short period of time? Then I have a second follow-up question if possible. That wasn't, that wasn't bad. I'm not, my nose isn't bloody enough for you yet. <laughs> I relent. I cry uncle. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm joking, of course, Emily. But you know, the reality is I think that is the hardest question for this project, frankly speaking. And it's something that, that I wrestle with and something that other people have asked me in various ways, usually not as um, eloquently as you have just done. Um, but I think it's the big one. It's the counterfactual, which is, is Kindleberger really wrong? Was there a version of the gold standard that could have been implemented successfully? Fine, James, okay, 25, 31, 27, 22, whatever, right? You could pick all these different dates and say, well, it wasn't, it could have worked here, it could have worked then, but it's a little bit like saying, well, the First World War began in August of 1914. It could have started 10 years earlier. Maybe they could have kicked the can down the road 10 years later, but, you know, a la John Mearsheimer, at the end of the day, these powers are going to fight. And at the end of the day, the central bankers are going to have to reconcile themselves to the reality that they printed way too much money. There's not enough gold. Crucially, the rate of increase in gold in the economy, the so-called gold scarcity, or fame, the ac accurately called gold scarcity of the late 1920s, is also a massive factor. And um, they're not going to open up with Waters Rand again. That gives new life to the gold standard from the 18. 1880s, 1890s, and so on. So I mentioned this figure that Keynes kept, uh, I'm sorry, that the Cunliffe Committee talked about. You need 150 million pounds sterling in reserve in the UK in order to run the gold standard. That was their figure. In the book, I show how they basically are just tossing numbers out, and they sort of figured this is a good number, as good as any. Your critique, the critique from your perspective, I think, would be maybe they were wrong. Maybe it was 300 million. Maybe they were never going to get there. What uh, the 150 million pound sterling figure, let me put that into context. Keynes estimated that just from those South African gold mines, they got 35 million pounds sterling per year of new gold. That wasn't going to last forever. So again, there's a question about, was this inevitable? And you're just tweaking at the margins here, James. Could have been this date or that date. But Germany and the UK were going to go to war. And it happened to be August of 14. I think I, I'm doing this because I think I have a slide. Um, this might speak to this. On hegemony, uh, economic orthodoxy says the UK was hegemonic because the Bank of England ran the proper gold standard. 
Kindleberger and this perspective of inevitability is the Bank of England was only able to run the gold standard quote unquote properly because it was hegemonic. As hegemony declines, it becomes inevitable. They aren't going to be able to do it. My story is that there were lots of equilibria out there. Lots of different things that could have been called the gold standard. They could have squared the circle. They didn't. It wasn't inevitable that they would slide off one of those equilibria. Various plausible gold standards independent of their hegemonic status. But like I say, this is the hardest question because it depends on this massive counterfactual. How much gold could the UK have gotten? How much could they have forced prices down in a sustainable way? And what would markets have done? So last point on this, I mentioned that before the war, the ratio was 85%. Then in the late 20s, they maintained the same London gold price. So markets are content with a ratio of 33%. How much lower could they have gone? That's a massive counterfactual. I don't know, because it depends on market psychology. Could they have gone to 10%? Could they have squared the circle that way? Some would say no, 33, they were pushing it. Does this make sense? Do you want to beat me up a little more? No. No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Great question, though, really. All right, so I will abuse my position and jump in on that one. I see Emily's question slightly differently. I'm going to offer you an out and see if you want to go for it, uh, which is the following. So... Nicola correctly said that what you've got here is a bunch of folk theorems. Mm -hmm. That's not a formal theory in that sense. But it is a map. It's a way of describing how the world works. And it's also prescriptive. This is how the world should work right? because of its distributional consequences. So there's a distinction between the map and the territory. And what happens at this particular moment in time is that distinction between the map and the territory becomes, because of World War I and all the rest of it, becomes rather extreme. right? And that's why you get this jumping around. I would say if you get to the end of the process, though, there's a more fundamental critique which you could make, which I think is a defense of your position, which is when they tried it, regardless of which form, it just led to a hemorrhaging of capital and the near collapse of the economy. So no amount of tweaking the standard would work because it was a fundamentally bad map of how the economy actually worked. And I think that we do this all the time, but we don't really reflect on it. A good example of this is, the, if you will, the Great Moderation Period, or if you will, the, R -star, the magic R-star period, right? Where you've got uh, Ben Ranke in 2004 comes along and writes his big uh, speech about the Great Moderation. Uniquely a wonderful moment where we understand what we're doing, and we have these tools, and we've got historic low volatility, whatever. And of course, behind the scenes, there's an enormous amount of leverage building up in the financial sector. We don't even factor in the financial sector. Why? Because it's not important in our models, right? So that's gone. So we're completely blind. It's like a gold standard model of the world. It's a shit model, right? So no amount of tweaking is going to save it because no matter how you employ it, it's going to blow up. And in 1926, it did when they hemorrhaged gold and unemployment went past one and a million, one and a half million. So I think that if you if you are going to defend it, that's how to do it. That it, there's no amount of tweaking the model because the model's wrong. Wow, but that doesn't. I, I don't. But uh, that's a, not a successful out if it's about the power of Keynes because then the power, Keynes is not blowing out the model. He, it's the map. People trying to. You yeah, different. it's about the world, it's all about but, Yes, right, so that, that's why that out doesn't work so well. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not I, I mean, I, I have made I clear... <laughs> Get out! I made clear that I don't like the gold standard, um, obviously, and I wouldn't prescribe it, and I think Keynes had the right idea. My story about Keynes, very simply, and I'll come back to the other things, so the story about Keynes in 31 is that Keynes says there's an equilibrium out there where you just use other tools to constrain the monetary authority. Everybody likes the gold standard because it's quote unquote naive proof, because we can't trust the central bankers. We've got to discipline them. And Keynes says, how about you discipline them with politics, with elections, and you have reasonable discussions about these things instead of depending on mysticism. And as Alfred Marshall himself said, the hazards of mining. That's a bad way to discipline them. And my story definitely shows it does not discipline anybody. Because look at this, right? It didn't discipline them before the war, during the war, or after the war. So Keynes is saying we're all freely floating. This is maybe a bit like Mark's point here. Right? We're all freely floating, and the world is largely what we construct of it. So if you tell everybody it must be 150 million, it becomes sacrosanct, and then everybody sees that as a bright line rule. Oh, the reserves are below 150. Oh, my gosh, everything will collapse. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because then everybody trades in their notes for the 150 million. And there's not enough gold to go around, and the system collapsed, and Keynes, and they say, we knew that 150 was important. And Keynes says, you told them it was important. You trained them. 
to make it important. If you had told them 100, that would have been fine. If you had told them 300, that would have been the point. So there is a sense not just in which you have a map and you have the world. Keynes is even deeper in the constructivist perspective. He's a much thicker constructivist because he says the world itself is shaped by the map. And let me give you a kind of really silly metaphor. I think it was maybe UC Santa Barbara, one of the UC schools. Can you go back to the mic? Yes, here? sorry. One of the UC schools um, didn't plan the, where people should, the pathways between buildings. They, they did not do that. They let people walk across the ground, and then they reified that and then paved over the paths that people had done. Now, it doesn't, I was just in Boston. It didn't work very well in Boston, where the cows sort of wandered around and the roads in Boston are now very strange. But Keynes has that kind of a story, which is that the world is what we tell people the world is. And if you tell them this is the key thing, and then you break the rule, good luck. Absolutely not. Do your follow-up. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, ideas trump institutions. Uh, Keynes is really important here. Um, uh -huh. So maybe you want to respond about uh, kind of the the failure of Keynes's idea of the Bancor. So why did Bancor not work, or why did Keynes not get that out of white? So Very nice white. Well. I, I think we know why he didn't get it out of white, yeah. but if, if, if Keynes has this power of the map actually influencing the world uh, and has this opportunity to kind of influence the global monetary order with his idea of the Bancor, how does that, uh, the failure of that idea factor into your story about kind of ideas trumping institutions? So could you explain power? Bancor before us that <laughs> don't know? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, I... I I think I understand the question. I know, I know what Keynes... Okay, so, so Keynes, in 1941, sits down as the Axis is rolling through the Soviet Union, sits down and says, hmm, U.S. is not anywhere in the war, but the U.S. and the U.K. are going to win this war, and then we're going to have to recreate the monetary system again. And I remember this guy called Woodrow Wilson, who did an awful job last time, so I'm going to not repeat his mistakes. So he starts working out actual concrete plans for the global financial system. At the same time, Harry Dexter White in the U.S. Treasury is doing the same thing. And so they come together in what becomes the Bretton Woods Conference, but they have years of, of interchange and planning, and they're trying to figure out, well, what do we want to have? And Keynes says, well, we need an, a standard international unit, but it's idiotic to make it be gold. That's just superstition, right? It's, it's superstition. So let's create a new international unit called um, Gramor, Unitas, Bancor is what it's ultimately called. And the United Nations will create that, the IMF will create that, and then everybody will trade that, but it won't have a material manifestation. Now, Harry Dexter White doesn't like this, partly because the US has all the gold, partly because he's a gold bug, partly because he's a very confused individual, Soviet sympathizer and, and everything else. Um, I have a, a different PhD student trying to figure him out, and that is a process. Um, I haven't figured him out, that's for sure. Um, maybe she will. Um, so, but the premise of the question is that, I mean, we then ultimately special drawing rights are kind of today's version of that, and it seems to work, but is that not right? Am I? Well, if ideas trump these other things, like why is he, what determines the degree of trumping this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Why, why is it that sort of it works at one point, it doesn't work in another? Right? Well, and yeah. Then, so the question is, you know, can you have a. <laughs> Here we go again. Yeah. So the question is, can, can you have an a priori theory of ideational success? Ah, yeah, so I get, the, I get, is that, yeah, I get this, I get this one a lot, and it's really tough. No, the answer is no. Yeah, I, I, I don't, you, you just I, can't, you just can't. I, I don't think so. So right. there are some features, right? So sometimes it fits well with institutional incentives, it, or it seems intuitive, but it's really, this is why I say individuals matter, because it's Keynes making these arguments to Churchill, and then people in the Treasury trying to go line by line on Churchill's reading of Keynes to explain why Keynes is wrong. But it, you know, Churchill gets hit by a bus, and they have somebody else in there as chancellor, it would, it would be different. Um, so, uh, but how can we know that austerity is going to be seen as by everybody as a great idea? I, I don't know. It's, if, it's, if it's a bad idea and a dangerous idea, nevertheless, people like it. But yeah. there is, i just say one more thing about this and plug in on this whole austerity thing. Part of it is that it feels right. Once you've done something wrong, this is why people who are religious, I come from a very religious family. I'm not myself religious, but that's partly why I have all this religious stuff, because I spend a lot of time talking to people and trying to understand how they see the world. 
When you do something that you think is wrong, like you print too much money, you feel like you need to do penance to make yourself feel better. So suffering is actually a feature, not a bug, mm -hmm. of austerity, auster monetary austerity, all these kinds of things. Yeah. So it appeals to a kind of intuitive logic or something or moral sensibility. So we're going to wrap it up now, but I will finish with a, a comment. My favorite part of the book is the three-way conversation that's going on with Churchill and Keynes. <laughs> And I guess it's Norman at that point in, in time. So Norman drops out of the conversation. And it really is this amazing sort of, and you didn't intend to do this, but it's this incredible rehabilitation of Churchill. Because, you know, he, he's a buffoon, right? I mean, he's sort of, you know, the, the bulldog, he's the war leader, whatever. But Are you talking about Churchill or the current prime Church, minister? Well, you know, um, it's, it's a, call that a genetic splice gone wrong. But anyway, um, you know, he comes across as a very sort of sophisticated individual with actually a, a surprisingly open mind. And the story that you tell is he really wants to buy the Keynesian line. But the problem is the Keynesian line isn't finished yet. It's like he's two-thirds of a way to understanding the flaws, but he doesn't have the gazumper to actually say, no, this is why. So you get this weird bit by the, this, the end of it, just before they go back on, and they're having dinner, and basically they say, you know this is going to be horrible. And they go, yeah, I know this is going to be horrible. And they're not actually playing their, well, never mind, a bit of horribleness goes a long way. They really don't like it, but there's a sense of inevitability that they can't do other. And I think that's actually the root, because when, even when you get down to two individuals whose decisions are about to shape everything, the fact that they feel that they can't do other, that's super interesting, that bit. So thank you for coming. It's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the question.